Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, my name's Sam. Uh, so let's talk a bit about me, and then uh, I'll tell you what I'm gonna, what I'm really here for. Um, I'm software engineer at Skyscanner. I've been there for about 18 months, which uh, is not very long at all, really. So uh, take everything I say with a pinch of salt. But um, if you want to get in touch, I'm on Twitter, but not worth following. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Skyscanner. Who's heard of it? We're traditionally a flight meta search, um, very much app focused. You can get flights, hotels, um, car hire, more recently trains. Um, basically, help you find your cheapest flights from anywhere to anywhere. Searching many, many, many different airlines, many different travel agents, hoping to find you the best deal. Uh, company values itself on being very sort of customer. Customer first, traveler first, we call it. Um, so all of our kind of internal procedures and all the way we kind of operate our business is supposed to be about thinking about the traveler. What would they want? What would be best for them? Even if it's not necessarily best for us. Um, one of our most popular features, anyone who ever comes to me is like, I've heard of Skyscanner, they always say, I like the everywhere search. You can just say, this is where I am. I don't know where I want to go. Uh, so if you've not heard of it, check it out. So what am I going to be talking about today? Um, you've got microservices, now what? Pain points of adopting microservices. Um, keeping them micro, as the name suggests, trying to not let them start out as a microservice and then scope kind of slowly grows. Uh, reducing the repetition of work. So if you've got many, many teams throughout your organization and they're there focused on, oh, this is my microservice, I'm going to build it from the ground up and after a bit, they start going, oh, this feature would be cool, this one would be cool, I need to have an API that does this. Oh, you're going to have multiple teams who aren't talking to each other doing the same thing. I'll tell you a bit about Skyscanner, what our kind of tech stack looks like. That's about it. Um, I was a little bit worried this morning because I noticed myself and the other speaker had the exact same talk title. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think I'm, I'm not quite as worried now, so uh, it should be quite different. So, it's called scaling microservices. This is your microservice that you want to scale. I'm not going to be talking about scaling microservices like this. You can, there are many, many guides out there about how to do that. Um, you've all heard of Kubernetes, ECS, and things like that. That's not my domain today. What I'm talking about is scaling microservices like this. So you've got another one, and another one, and another one, and so it goes on. And this is the point where, that I was kind of getting at before. What happens when you're kind of you're keeping on adding new microservices? Where are you going to kind of encounter problems and that kind of stuff? You got the photo? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to take it off Sorry. while you were. <laughs> um, OK, so where are we going to start? You've got your microservice, and it does exactly what you do. You're implementing some API, you're implementing your business logic, and that kind of stuff. It's all going really well. And then you realize, OK, this, this API, we don't want just anyone to be able to access it. And when they do access it, we want to know who it is and that kind of stuff. So we need to put in some kind of authentication um, to our API. Great, you've got that now. Um, and then you notice, oh, OK, so we've got all these different consumers accessing it. And then every Thursday afternoon, performance just drops because this one consumer is just like suddenly does a batch job and they're massively increasing the number of requests. And you know, that's ruining the experience for everyone else because it you know, takes some time to scale up or something. So let's put in some rate limiting. Let's say, no, right, your batch job doesn't need to happen right now. You need to slow it down and wait, for, wait until we're OK. So you implement that. Um, as time goes on, you might have other problems. If you've got to work for a company like Skyscanner, then there are like, constantly bots scraping your site. And this might be a problem. Some of your teams encounter, and they start implementing their own solutions. Um, cores is a big one uh, that I've personally had to work a lot with recently. Skyscanner being across many, many different domains, like uh, domains as in like web domains, um, makes it quite complicated. So implementing that in your microservice can get harder and harder. Um, I'm going to kind of skip over these, but there's all sorts of different things that might be sort of common problems that lots of your teams have. And you've got to remember that it's not just you trying to fix these problems. It's probably 
a lot of people in your organization, if you're in the kind of hundreds or more developers kind of region, not everyone is talking to everyone. So there's definitely going to be people trying to solve the same problems. So you've got other people making their microservices, doing all the exact same stuff. So let's go back. You've got your microservice, and you've got many of them. Um, and they're sat behind some load balancer. If you're on cloud, um, we use AWS very heavily. So uh, these are sort of classic load balancers or the application load balancers. Um, and then you've got all your other teams, or maybe even within your team, you're creating multiple load balancers. Now, maybe we could have something that sits in front of all of those and implements all of these things. And that way, your teams can stay focused on doing what they do on their kind of specialist domain knowledge and not have to implement every single one of these things themselves. And the thing, the solution we, we've found for this problem, uh, the scale that Skyscanner is at, is an API gateway. And this sits in front of your, um, all of your microservices and allows you to implement all of that different logic and leave your teams to solve their kind of specific problems in their microservices themselves. And you can imagine this is traffic coming into your website or your service or whatever it is. And we implement all of these things here and then every, every microservice is left to its own. So a bit about Skyscanner. Um, I'm sure you'll be happy to hear at JVM roundabout that uh, Java features pretty <laughs> heavily at Skyscanner, uh, along with Python and Node. And for each of those, we're, there's kind of a, a main sort of supported framework. That, so for Java, we use DropWizard, um, Python, AIO, HTTP, and Node use Express. And um, the idea of this is to try and, if we try and keep all of our microservices looking a very similar shape, then we keep the, the problems that people are encountering similar, and then it makes it easier to solve those kind of at scale. Um, so we're not trying to solve them in many different ways. Uh, in terms of platform, I mentioned before we're on AWS. Traditionally, we've been um, almost completely on Amazon's ECS service, the, uh, which is essentially just distributed Docker. It allows you to run, run Docker across many uh, EC2 hosts. And then more recently, to Kubernetes. Um, not through EKS, we're um, sort of running our own Kubernetes effectively. In terms of our sort of continuous integration and continuous delivery, this is something that's pretty important to Skyscanner. So uh, shipping, shipping fast, failing fast, shipping multiple times a day is kind of a thing that's definitely celebrated, um, especially more and more recently. Uh, we use Drone, which is an open source sort of continuous integration tool, similar to something like Jenkins, but it's a bit, it's, it's, not, it's not nearly as popular, but um, it's based on a very sort of simple concept of every, every sort of step in your pipeline is just a Docker image, and that Docker image has an entry point, which could be anything. So it could be a, a bash script, or it could be your unit tests or something. And this allows you, each part is sort of very sort of plug and play. Um, you can sort of publish these plugins, which are essentially just Docker images to some sort of registry. And um, your pipeline is just sort of a, essentially a list of Docker plugins that you're, you, or uh, Docker images that you run. And then we have our own in-house deployment tool called Slingshot. Um, now this has existed for a while at Skyscanner, and it started out just basically doing very simple microservice deployments. More recently, it does things like deploy infrastructure using CloudFormation, just by essentially applying your templates with parameters that you specify, and deploying things like lambdas. And this allows you to have quite a complex deployment pipeline um, to get your microservices sort of out there as quickly as possible. And Slingshot, there's a sort of pretty much an entire team dedicated towards developing that, because the way the organization sees it is that it's very essential that you need the right tools for your developers to be able to deploy their microservices quickly, detect problems quickly, and have that sort of uh, fast sort of iteration, those sort of fast iterations, um, in order to get deliver value to your customers quickly. 
Um, so I'm going to pop back to API gateways. We use an open source tool called Kong, um, which I'm sure quite a few, few of you might have heard of. It's essentially a wrapper around Nginx that provides an API to update its configuration. So it allows you to sort of update that dynamically rather than having to sort of edit a config file. Um, so we use Amazon EC2 for this. Um, this is my EC2. <laughs> um, I was actually a bit surprised making this. All the, all the icons seem to have changed recently. I wasn't something I was aware of. So this is Kong. Uh, this is the logo from Gorilla uh, running on that. And then the, the other main thing we run on there is Hacker, which is an open source project from Mozilla that basically just gets your logs off, off your image, off your box, basically. Um, of course, it's not just one of these. Um, our API gateways are serving in the region of half a million requests a minute. So we're running, it's a reasonably large scale across multiple AWS regions. Um, so they've got sort of multiple clusters of these sitting behind load balancers. Um, let's just show load balancers also provide us some metrics that uh, help us with diagnosing any issues. And um, all the Kong configuration is stored uh, in an RDS database. So, um, and the last thing here is uh, we use, I mentioned rate limiting before, to give a kind of consistent view for each node about um, how many requests each consumer has made and that kind of stuff. We use Elasticash, so I kind of keep going. And then this is just to show any requests coming in. Um, Kong does kind of path-based routing to say, which microservice should I be sending this to? Got your phone? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure, as you can imagine, there's a reasonable amount of complexity already, and this goes wrong a fair bit. And I mentioned also that, well, a fair bit. It, it, it can go wrong, and you have to sort of plan for this eventuality. Um, we have this kind of multiple AWS regions, and the idea is that we can kind of progressively allow our um, engineers to deploy changes as of when they need to using Slingshot, our deployment tool. Um, and that means they can um, kind of deliver value to our customers. It also means they can break things whenever we don't know they're going to do it. Um, so we need a pretty resilient global routing strategy. Uh, we use Akamai as our CDN. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's a reasonably large one. Um, and essentially, if you go to any sort of Skyscanner domain, we direct you to some region. Um, first of all, we decide, are you near a kind of Europe or are you near Asia? And then, um, say you're near Asia, we send you to kind of like our APAC only domain. This is essentially just like we're CNaming you to another domain. Um, and then from there, we kind of 50-50 weights all the traffic between two regions. Uh, we do the exact same thing in Europe. Um, but the idea is that we have, uh, we use the kind of Route 53 health checks. So any time if we detect there's problems going on, say we've complete, engineers completely messed it up, both of these regions here are broken, um, we can just redirect all the traffic straight over to, to Asia. Um, now, that might not be great for performance, but, but it means that any time we're kind of... Um, we can serve the traveler. It's much better to be online and slow than completely offline. Um, from, from these kind of failover, uh, well, this sort of apex domain, uh, so we have health checks saying, if this is unhealthy, send the traffic here. We can do some further health checks to say, where should we send the traffic to? So that's how we kind of do the, the, the crisscross. Now that allows us to test say, a whole region is having a problem, or maybe even a whole hemisphere. But what happens if just an individual service is having a problem? We might want, not want to uh, completely take that region out of the picture. So I mentioned before we have Kong, and um, it's essentially Nginx, like a sort of reverse proxy. A request comes in to region A, and it wants to access some service foo. So we send that to foo. Um, another request comes in to bar. And that request goes there. But say we've noticed, you know, 
that service is having issues right now. Um, someone's gone and deployed some code, and it's completely broken, and it's not going to be fixed in the next 30 seconds. So it's going to be a matter of minutes. We need to, a, a request has come in. We need to send it somewhere. We can kind of dynamically send that request to another region. Um, I talked about that Kong API, API before, and that allows us to dynamically say, hey, any request coming in for this service, I don't, you can't send it here. It's completely broken. I need you to send it to this other region. Yes, there'll be some performance, performance problems, but like, we need to serve that request. So having something as flexible as Kong, um, it's a really solid sort of open source project that uh, we're able to build upon we're able to s serve requests, hopefully all the time, if not whenever, whenever we can. And obviously, every service, we try to make sure it's deployed in as all four regions, if possible, um, just to be sure that we can maximize the chances of serving that request at any time. Um, so deployments, um, who has heard of well, or uses blue-green deployments, a few of you. So the, the, kind of, the idea here is that you have your, say, your instances running. These can be containers or virtual machines or whatever, and you want to make a change. So instead of trying to make the change to these live running boxes, you sort of bring up new ones um, and let them serve some of the traffic. So this essentially means you're very over-provisioned for a short period of time. If things are looking bad, it's very easy just and very quick just to get rid of those new instances. And if things are looking good, after a period of time where you're like, OK, things are looking happy, you get rid of the old ones. Um, being fully in cloud, like Skyscanner, means you can be very flexible. You're paying by the minute for these instances. So having being doubly like over-provisioned twice like three or four minutes, it's not that big a deal, cost-wise. Um, but what about something more disruptive? Say you need to make a change to your whole stack. I talked about this before. This is our, like our gateway setup, but this could be anything, right? Like you've got some microservice deployed. They're talking to databases. They're talking to all these different things. Well, why not do the same thing but for your entire infrastructure? So one of the great things that Slingshot allows us to do is redeploy a whole second copy of our infrastructure. And um, the only thing you kind of really need to do is to be able to replicate your data stores. If you're using some caching, then probably that doesn't need to be replicated. But um, I'll talk a bit more about how, in, our, in this specific case, we're able to kind of replicate our databases quite quickly. Um, and yeah, like I mentioned, Slingshot is the tool we, we kind of use to do this. And this gives you complete isolation, right? Because all these, you've got your two load balancers. They both have some DNS records. And um, you can use, uh, Route 53 has a, this kind of weighted endpoints. And that means when someone does a DNS lookup for your, uh, for your service, you can say, I want 99% of the time, give them this one. This is the one I know is good. It works but 1% of the time, give them this one. And that means you can start to slowly move traffic over dynamically and say, continue to monitor your metrics, continue to do those checks. And this can be, to begin with, if you're implementing this, just do it manually, right? Like move 10% of the traffic, look at your dashboards, is this looking good? And then slowly over time, you build up that confidence to be able to do this kind of more, more automated. I can start out just being like a script you run locally, checking some high level metrics and you kind of keep an eye on it. And as things progress, you're able to automate that more and more to the point where you can do kind of complete infrastructure deployments, um, move that traffic over, monitor the metrics the whole time, and get rid of the old one, uh, and be having your lunch at the same time. And if you come back, you'll either all your traffic can be on the new one or the old one, depending on how it went. But how to keep them in sync? So this is not going to work for every, every service. Um, but I'm just going to describe how we kind of keep that, that gateway configuration in sync. Um, so when people, well, when engineers define their, their APIs, so they, they're setting up a new one, uh, they say, essentially, this is kind of give you, going to give you a bit of insight into how 
you kind of specify what they call a drone plugin, which is essentially a Docker image that you can, you can see there. We've got a specific one. Um, it just looks like a normal Docker image. You're allowed to sort of pass it some parameters. So publish as, we essentially mean, what's, this, what's the name of this API? Um, so if you go to sort of skyscan.net slash my API, where should we send that? Um, you can pro provide some basic parameters. So these kind of, you'll see these kind of correlate with the things I talked about at the start. Um, things like IP restriction, rate limiting, um, bot blocking, health checking, and all that kind of stuff. Like how should we know um, when your API is healthy, what kind of response should we expect, which endpoint should we be checking? Um, the great thing here is that engineers are able to define that in their, in their Git repositories. They're completely in control of that. But we want to get, take, take that configuration and update the con, con configuration, which is stored in Postgres. And we need to first, we need to give developers control of that and allow them to release on their own cycle, and not, not send in their way. But at the same time, we need to um, kind of make this happen in a, a kind of seamless way uh, without, without us getting involved. So like I said, we need to talk to the Kong API and store it in Postgres. Now, and that information needs to come from GitHub. We trigger a drone build um, when engineers deploy to, like sort of merge to master. And because at Skyscanner, we have the, this concept of kind of a merge to master is a release to production. Uh, so what we could do here is have drone just talk to the, these Kong instances. And this is actually what we used to do. Um, the problem with this we found was that at any given point, it's really hard to know what should be running in production. Like, yay, yeah, OK, we triggered some config changes. But like someone could, they used to have the master branch as their like, default branch, and now they've changed it. So which one do they build off? Or maybe they have like a special branch they use for releasing. Like that's all up to them. So it's really hard to kind of you'd be sort of searching through Git, going like, I don't really understand. Like this is the state this API is in, but I, I don't really know what did the developer intend. Um, maybe that kind of stuff is is fine at the start, and it's probably the right decision to do at the beginning, as we kind of worked out how people were going to use these APIs. But as time went on. Um, it got more and more to the point where we were kind of manually tracking people down and saying, hey, like, do you even use this API anymore? Like, it, and it, it got a bit manual. So what we kind of thought was we need some source of truth that um, sits in a place where we can say, right, if we ever need to recreate this config or need to know what should be happening, that's where we look. So simple thing. We just made our drone builds, copy everyone's config to an S3 bucket. And we use the, the kind of S3 built-in inversioning. So each time they upload a new one, it just kind of overwrites. But really, behind the scenes, all the old ones are still there. So if we ever need to revert or anything like that, we're good to do so. Um, and what we do is trigger notifications on that to kind of, when uh, we have this service called Kongloader that kind of consumes off a queue to, to update that. Um, and from <coughs> Kong loader then sort of talks to the, the API. Now that means that whenever we're deploying a new stack, all our configuration is here. So we're able to um, kind of completely recreate that from scratch if we need to. Um, as I mentioned, we're in multiple regions. So we don't actually have just one S3 bucket. We store, we store that across all four, sort of four regions, the idea being that Every region is isolated, and any problems in one aren't going to affect the others. I think I've gone a bit over my time. I'm not sure, but um, we're hiring. Are there any questions? 